Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to our discussion about the Punic Wars, right? We're discussing the Punic Wars, this big Roman model for conquest that we did such a good job talking about in class yesterday. Uh, particularly, I think we had a really, really good time in B and C period, right? And I know we're going to have a good time in F period today, right? Now, the big thing about it, though, getting into it, we started talking about the Roman model for conquest, right? We started talking about how the heck is Rome going to go from this little, little bitty baby village with, like, little mud huts to being this brick. Well, the big thing about it, though, in general is... We did discuss how this was never the intended plan for Rome and every Exactly. Now, the big thing about it, though, is, is that this was never the intended plan for Rome. They never intended to grow this large, but it kind of just started happening. And the Punic Wars is the tipping point or the turning point to which it's going to really truly begin. That Rome is going to begin to expand and gobble up all these different territories. And the big thing about it, though, is that as we talked about in class, um, and I think we left off right here in C period, uh, by 272 BC, all of the peninsula is under Roman control, right? Give or take most of it, except for this little region in the north that's just like considered the Alpine Gauls, right? Now, the thing about it, though, in general, is there are under Roman control, and a rivalry has developed between them and this city-state known as Carthage, right? And Carthage is this large city-state right here across the Mediterranean from Rome. They also control half of Sicily. <laughs> they also control Corsica and Sardinia. And they also have a very, very large navy, right? Because they were founded by the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians were a trade people that actually developed the phonetic alphabet. And that is where their foundings culturally are actually going to lie, right? And as we can tell, they are a trade society, trade-based civilization. They have tons and tons of boats. And their military is best known as their navy. Whereas Rome, their military is best known as their land army, right? We kind of got a, like a little bit of a Peloponnesian War situation going on here. But the big thing about it, though, getting into it, is what is the big cause of this rivalry? What's the big cause of this war? What is really going to be the driving force to make, bring these two to collision course with one another, these two nemesis, nemesis, ne nemesis, nemesis. Now, the big thing about it, though, in general, it's all trade, right? It's all trade. Everybody has to understand that most of this stuff is always going to be caused by money and how much money you are making and the other guy is not, right? Like, so the thing about it is we believe, that as historians in the historical community, that one, first and foremost, you don't want a big bad baddie right next door to you, right? First of all, one big cause of this war is going to be the fact that Car Cor no, no, Corsica, Carthage is very, very large and very intimidating, and Rome does not like the fact that they're very, very close by, so this could lead to the war as well. But a big thing also is these harbors and ports right here on Sicily, which are the only natural harbors really in Italy at all that were originally colonized by the Greeks and then later taken over by the Carthaginians, right? And so Carthage controlled half of Sicily, and this big hullabaloo started up and it leads to the very first Punic War, right? And the very first Punic War starts mostly due to the fact that what's going to happen is it's all going to be over Sicily, right? They wanted Sicily. They didn't like how Carthage is very, very large, very, very close by. And the Sicilian ports are going to become very important to Rome with the ability to trade throughout the Mediterranean, right? But again, it's one of these little weird situations where Sicily's a small island, right? It's not that large, right? It's only about the size of, like, southeast Louisiana, right? So the big thing about it, though, in general, is these first battles that start over the island of Sicily have a very weird origin story. The very first Punic War actually happens because Rome allied with this small city-state of Syracuse, and they tried to take Syracuse, or they tried to take Sicily from Carthage, and then Carthage allied with these pirates. It's a whole thing. It's pirates. They're everywhere and stuff like that. Basically, the other little weird thing about it, too, is that pirates are just anybody, any guys on a boat without a country. Like, so, like, now, but in general, pirates were involved, Syracuse was involved, and Rome and Carthage go to war with each other, right? Well, in a big way, this war wasn't originally a stalemate, right? A lot of small battles that never really had a big result because Rome was up on its peninsula with its cliff line, like coastline, and like so there was no way for the Carthaginians to get to them. And then the Romans couldn't go off and fight the Carthaginians because the Carthaginians were out in the water and they had a very, very big navy, right? Well, the thing about it is Rome is going to decide to build a navy, right? They literally build a navy out of sunken Carthaginian ships, right? Look, sunken Carthage shit. All right, so like literally we actually look at the first Punic War and apparently according to the story is that Romans found boats at the bottom of the ocean. Boats like these, these triremes just like the Carthaginians actually built. They found them dug them up from the bottom of the ocean, and then reverse engineered them, right? This right here is one of those bronze battering rams we talked about on the front of the triremes that would 
pop a hole in a boat and then actually sink it down to the ground, right? Or sink it down to the bottom of the ocean. The big thing about it, there's another one right here. Look, I, if I found one of these, I'd geek out. My ultimate nerd job is underwater archaeologist, just to let you know. So the big thing about it, though, in general, is as you can see, we believe that the Romans found sunken Carthaginian ships, and we believe that they actually dug them up and reverse engineered them and made it so they could build up a navy of their own, right? So looking and going into the story as well, Rome is going to end up winning the first Punic War, and not a huge decisive manner, but they're going to build up a navy and make trireme vessels of their own, and they're going to actually go out there, and they're going to beat up on Carthage, right? And so looking at this map now, Rome is going to take Sicily, it's going to ally, with, of course, with Sardinia, it's going to take Corsica, or not Sardinia, Syracuse, it's going to take Corsica and Sardinia, and it's going to grow its influence, right? But something you need to understand about other Punic Wars and other wars in general is that Carthage is going to now be forced to pay what's known as reparations, right? Reparations as in they have to pay Rome for losing this war, right? The thing about it in general, though, okay, write that down. Carthage has to pay for the war. Write that down. Carthage has to pay for this war, right? Carthage has to pay for the war, and they start running out of money, right? So, like, and it's when this one very prominent individual comes into power and play, right? So there was this guy in the first Punic War who was a Navy, like, admiral in and of himself, but he fought for Carthage. He didn't fight for Rome, right? And he's really furious with Rome because he doesn't like the fact that he lost to Rome, right? That Carthage has lost to Rome. And now that his country must pay them back, right, he finds it disgusting. He's actually, fun fact, a mercenary as well. Like, technically, Carthage has no army. Like, this is another little weird thing about Carthage. They don't have an army. They have to pay people to go out there and be their army, so that's why they would pay sailors all the time to have a really big navy. So the big thing about it in general, though, is this guy is furious with with Rome. He hates Rome's guts now because he has lost them in war, and his name is Hamilcar, right? Hamilcar is this very prominent figure in Roman history who's going to be very important going forward. Hamilcar is this general of the Carthaginian forces, and he is furious that he now has to pay Rome back for this war. So he goes off into southern, or like, and then like, well, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting excited. I apologize about that. Hamilcar has to have, like, pay off like Rome for the losing of this war. And he also has a son, and his son's name is Hannibal. And Hannibal at this point in the First Punic War is a young man, very, very young and stuff like that. And Hamilcar hates Rome so much that he makes Hannibal swear on a sacrificed dead goat that he will forever hate Rome. I want you to imagine that for a hot second. Your dad just kills a goat and puts it on a pedestal, and you have to put your hand on top of it and swear to forever hate Rome, right? And so Hamilcar, with the aid of his son Hannibal, who is right here, their last names are both Barca, B-A-R-C-A, -A, Hannibal Barca and Hamilcar Barca. Um, so now the big thing about it is Hannibal and Hamilcar are going to be very, very important, right? And so apparently Hannibal swears on this dead animal that he will forever hate Rome, which is actually right there underneath his foot. Now the big thing about it, though, is general, is that Hannibal and Hamilcar are disgusted with Rome, and they hate the fact that they have to pay them back, so they go off into southern Spain where they try to find uh, like silver mines, right? So Hamilcar and Hannibal head off into southern Spain, down here in this area right here. Come on, Map. Come on, Map. Where you at, Map? Map, I need you. If there's a place you gotta go, I'm the one you need to know. I'm the Map. I'm the Map. I'm the Map. If there's a place you gotta get, I can get you there, I bet. I'm the that's right. Thank you, Matt. All right, so the big thing about it is Hannibal and Hamilcar, Hamilcar being the dad, Hannibal is the son, head off into southern Spain and take over these areas right there, right? They name one very prominent city, Carthago Nova, or New Carthage, and they create all these different little silver mines, right? And they start trying to mine all this silver to pay Rome back for the First Punic War. But Rome tells them straight up, they're like, hey, 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 you two, over there in Spain, messing around. We've got colonies over here in this area right here. Don't you dare cross that river. Don't you dare cross that river. You cross that river, we're going to go to war again, and we're going to come over there, and we're going to whoop your tails, right? Hamilcar and Hannibal take this as a massive insult, being like, what do you mean, don't cross this river? And then they did what? Cross the river anyway, right? So Hamilcar and Hannibal decide to start attacking Roman forces in the south of Spain, because they're like, we've had enough of this crap. We've had enough of this garbage. We're just going to go out there, and we're going to fight the Romans, and we're going to do whatever we want. And so Rome is going to be threatened when Hamilcar and Hannibal start going and trying to invade them. Hamilcar stays back in Spain. Listen to me closely. Hamilcar stays back in Spain and fights the Roman forces in Spain, right? And then Hannibal decides, oh no, father, I'm not going to sit here in Spain and fight the Roman forces. I'm going to march on the city of Rome itself and try to destroy it from the inside, right? Hannibal recruits a massive army of 
thousands of men and decides that he is going to march over the Alps, those really, really tall mountains that protected Rome in the north, and he's going to show up and march on the city of Rome, right? The thing about it, though, in general, is he even brought elephants over the Alps, which is bananas. He apparently brought 38 elephants over the Al Alpine mountain range, which is crazy. Can you imagine taking 38 elephants over frosted mountains and stuff like that? Only a handful of them lived, by the way. Most of the elephants actually died on the, on the crossing and stuff like that because a bunch of them like slipped off the edge right here and stuff like that and actually fell into a ravine at the bottom, which I don't know why, but imagining an elephant falling is hilarious. But the biggest thing about it, though, in general, is they did have massive victories, right? Something you need to understand, jot this down real quick because it's going to be extra credit on your test. It's going to be extra credit on your test. You need to know this because it's going to be extra credit on your test. Hannibal, when you're talking about the Second Punic War, a lot of people like to talk about how Hannibal was in Spain fighting off the Roman forces. Hannibal goes into Italy, and he's, like, marching onto, like, Rome and stuff like that. Everybody's like, oh, was he there for, like, five minutes? Was Hannibal only there for, like, a month and a half? Hannibal was in Italy for 16 years, burning down farms, burning down other people's villages, burning down other things, trying to goad all the Roman forces to come out and fight him, right? And actually, at one point, there was this one gigantic battle, this one huge battle where, like, Athens, or not Athens, excuse me, where Rome goes out to try and fight Hannibal and stop him and stuff like that and all of his forces. And what ends up happening, though, in the long run is Hannibal is sitting on top of this giant elephant. It's his favorite elephant. It's his pet elephant. The pet elephant's name is Sura. And, like, so he's sitting on top of his favorite elephant, and he's just looking at the Roman forces, and he's just like, what do you want, bro? Come at me, right? This Carthaginian general is threatening all of Italy, burning all these things to the ground. The Romans show up very cocky and arrogant during the Second Punic War, during the 16 years of being destroyed by the Hannib Hannibal's army and stuff like that. And so they go out there at the Battle of Cani, and they try to fight Hannibal, and they lose in a huge way, right? Hannibal's armies literally apparently took Roman like, prisoners because their arms got tired of stabbing Romans to death. Like, it's crazy. They legitimately apparently fought the Romans so badly. But the thing about it was Hannibal never took the city of Rome. Hannibal never took the city of Rome. He was sitting on Surah, and Surah died later on, which really stinks. But he was sitting on Surah at one point, and they tried to attack the city of Rome, but there's this huge marsh that actually is around the city of Rome, and he couldn't get through it. And actually, while he was trying to get through this big marsh and swamp and stuff like that outside of Rome, he got an infection in his eye, and they had to dig it out with a sword and pop his eyeball out to keep him from dying, right? So Hannibal spent 16 years trying to attack the city of Rome, and he never fully got all the way through, which is absolutely bananas. But while he's doing this, he's destroying all this stuff. He's killing Roman soldiers at the Battle of Canaanite. His arms are getting tired from stabbing people to death. And then, a stroke of genius. A Roman general comes along by the name of Scipio Africanus, right? Scipio Africanus rolls up and decides that he is actually going to be the guy that's going to go and turn the tide of this war, right? Scipio Africanus is going to be the main member of the Second Punic War, that is going to turn the tides from Carthage winning with Hannibal and Hamilcar towards the Romans winning, right? The stroke of genius by Scipio Africanus is like, wait a minute, Carthage doesn't have an army. They pay these guys, right? They control Spain, and Hannibal's wreaking havoc all over Italy. But wait a second. If he's here and Hamilcar's over there, then who's protecting Carthage? Oh, wait, no one. And so Scipio decides to take a large Roman army through the Alps into Spain, defeats the Hamilcar forces. And Hamilcar dies out there, actually, which is really interesting. Hamilcar goes out there and tries to de carthage Spain, right? So he goes out there, he attacks Spain. Hamilcar dies in one of these massive battles and stuff like that. And at this point... Hamilcar is dead, and Hannibal is still in Italy, and Scipio is getting closer and closer to the city of Carthage. And literally, he's just like, Hannibal's like, I'm not, oh, God, oh, no. And then Hannibal, right, in this moment is when Hannibal wouldn't budge, so he turned his sights on the city of Carthage, right? So the big thing about it in general is Scipio is on his way to attacking Carthage, and so Hannibal now has to leave Italy, stop attacking all of Italy, and he has to go and defend Carthage, right? And at the Battle of Zama, this massive Roman victory at the Battle of Zama, when Scipio's forces defeat Hannibal's forces, Carthage surrendered in 202 BC, right? Hannibal even had to flee and find another job in another kingdom. The last we ever heard about Hannibal with his one eyeball and stuff like that is he was like living out towards Turkey and he was like a general of one of their armies and stuff like that. And one of the last things we heard is one of his grand military plans was to throw snakes at another army, right? Now the big thing about it though is Carthage is going to lose because Scipio Africanus is going to attack Carthage while all the Carthaginian forces are in Italy and in Spain, right? 
genius move. And that's actually why he's called Scipio Africanus. He's called Africanus because he went out and attacked Africa, right? You see how that works? He earned a nickname because he went out and attacked Africa, Scipio Africanus. And then the big thing about it, though, is the last one you need to know is the Third Punic War, which broke out in 146 BC. It's basically like Rome was just like, you know what stinks? Carthage still exists. Like, so they're like, let's go destroy them. And so Scipio's grandson goes off and destroys Carthage. Like, burns it to the ground, wrecks it completely and stuff like that, and decides to burn it into ruins, right? There are ruins of Carthage still left that were popping up around, but according to the story, is Rome even actually went out and decided to salt the land of Carthage to prevent anything from growing, right? Now, an interesting little fact about this is that when you salt the land, it makes it so nothing will ever grow there ever again, which is like a giant Roman screw you for the rest of eternity. They're like, you know what, Carthage, nobody likes you anyway. And they decide to salt the land and destroy everything that they held dear. But the thing about it in reality, it would be a borderline impossible to salt all the lands of Carthage. So what Romans would usually do whenever they declared war is they would bring a piece of the land of Carthage into the Roman Forum. They would literally have like a square of grass from Carthage. They would put it in the Roman Forum. And they'd be like, we declare war on Carthage, and they'd stab it with a spear. And then apparently in a ceremony, they salted that little piece of land, right? Like, so like now, but I still think it's funny that they like salted all the land. Now, after that, though, what's going to happen is now that they've taken over Carthage, they're on the like western bank of the Mediterranean. They turn their sights to all these other people all around the Mediterranean. They go out and attack Greece and they take them over. They go out and attack Macedonia and they take them over. They go out and actually attack parts of Asia and all this begins to fall under Roman control, right? They use diplomacy and threats during the Punic Wars. But the big thing about it in general is that the Punic Wars set up this model for Roman conquest that they're going to expand and grow very, very rapidly, right? Now, the thing about it is, after that, the Roman Republic would be divided up into provinces, and a governor would be appointed to rule each one of them. The people of the new provinces had to pay taxes to Rome, and a lot of them were taken into slavery, right? So something that you need to focus on really quickly when we're looking at this gigantic empire, right? All the people that lived here were known as the Gauls, right? All the people that lived here were the Visigoths. All the people that lived here were the Carthaginians, Egyptians, all this stuff later on. Every time that Romans would take something over, they would bring these people back into Rome as slaves, right? So Visigoths were being brought into Rome as slaves. Gauls were being brought into Rome as slaves. Carthaginians were being brought into Rome as slaves. The Greeks were being brought into Rome as slaves. As a very special kind of slave, they were actually used as tutors for their children and stuff like that because Greeks are smart. So they were like, oh, teach my kid how to read, dum-dum. Like, so like, yeah, the big thing about it, though, in general, is they started bringing them all into indentured servitude and slavery, right? And so what's happening is we now have a lot of major effects of Roman conflict. Right? Because of this, we got problems that are popping up in the late Republic period because of all this conquest. Right? So Rome has taken over Carthage. They're now gone. Hannibal and Hamilcar, both now dead. Right? And we're moving forward. But the thing is, is remember, Hannibal was in Rome or in Italy for 16 years on the back of an elephant trying to destroy the place. So we're going to have some issues, right? Some big issues include the fact that, first and foremost, a lot of people are dead, right? So, like, a lot of Roman soldiers are dead, right? Remember at the Battle of Cani, the, the Hannibal, just his arms were getting tired from stabbing so many Romans that he took prisoners, right? So you got a lot of manpower lost, right? Lost many soldiers during these wars of expansion. And a big thing about that is, is that men in Roman society had a lot more rights than women, and women weren't allowed to own property in Rome, right? And because of which is super screwed up, I agree, Molly. But looking at the, this going forward is you have to understand is that when these soldiers wouldn't come back, their land was left open and patricians would start gobbling it up, right? And Rome didn't have like a constitution per se, and even the system of beliefs that they believed in, which could be called the Roman constitution, was only meant for one city, not an empire, right? And so veterans of these wars also feel crazy unsupported and taken advantage of because the ones that did live and made it all the way back to their farms during the wars of conquest and while Hannibal was in Italy destroying all these farms, a lot of their farms have been destroyed, right? And they're just sitting there on smoldering heaps of ash, and they're like, bro, what am I supposed to do with this? My family's all dead. Like, I'm sitting here with no land, and they burned all my land. All my crops are gone. How am I supposed to stay alive? And the veterans had all these patricians rolling up to them because the countryside is in shambles, and the soldiers are coming back to garbage, and all their farms have been destroyed. And the thing about it is, is what's happening is Rome is not taking care of its veterans, right? This is a problem in our society even to this day, is taking care of veterans is very, very important, but it's something that we do not do well enough, right? And the big thing about it in general, though, is that these veterans in ancient Rome are coming home, and their farms are destroyed, their families are dead, they have no way of making money, but then who's 
He was slippering up a little bit. Some people are showing up making wanting to make some money off this, and these patricians are coming up to these plebeian soldiers being like, oh, I'll buy your burned down farm from you, but I'm not paying full price. I'm paying a small amount. And the veterans have to take it. They have to take this money, and they start flooding into the cities, trying to find work and stuff like that. And so the cities are becoming overcrowded, and it's really, really disgusting there. And there's no work or labor that's actually there for them to find. And they're just showing up, and they're just like, I got to buy work. Uh. But what this is going to lead to is a lot of these veterans are mad, and they're very, very upset, right? They're super, super upset. Just like Darius was upset these veterans are super upset after these wars because they're like, I am a Roman soldier. The only reason Hannibal is gone is because of people like me. The only reason Carthage is destroyed and salted is because of people like me. The only reason that we took over all this stuff is because of people like me, right? But you're not helping me. You're taking my land. You're buying it for nothing. I'm now in a city trying to find a job, and I'm working as a launderer, and they, like, literally, like, Romans wash everything in human pee. So literally, like, that's the job he now had. He once had a farm, and now he's being taken advantage of. What's going to happen, though, is some of these generals that used to lead them are going to see this as an opportunity to take some power, right? And so you're going to see civil wars breaking out all over the empire, right? You're going to see rogue generals leading some of these mad veterans against other groups of Roman generals and having a bunch of civil wars, which are further destroying the society in and of itself, right? So we've got a lot of dysfunction in Rome right now. All this land that's been acquired by Rome is really messing them up. It's messing them up in a big way because they're like, how are we supposed to fix all this stuff? And wealthy Romans, as they began buying up the land for no money, veterans are finding little or almost no work for care. They're being considered, like, like goaded into going out and fighting civil wars. You're going to see the rise of two very important figures in Roman history that are going to change the tides of how everything is going, right? Now, I need you to do me a favor. Write this down as a really big, intense title. Write down rise, R-I-Z-E, not Z-E, R-I-S-E, of the, and then write these two brothers, right? These two brothers rise up to try and fix life for the veterans to prevent some of these civil wars from happening, right? And so here we go. It's rise of the G-R-A-C-C-I, G-R-A-C-C-I. The Gracchi, right? The Gracchi refers to the Gracchus brothers, right? And so these two dudes pop up in Roman history with the intention of trying to fix life for the veterans and prevent some of these civil wars from going down, right? So the very first one that pops up, who's super important, is Tiberius Gracchus, right? Tiberius Gracchus, who, first and foremost, when we're looking at his titles, he's a plebe? Like, so yeah, he is a plebeian man who has a very, very, very good wealth and money, who is educated and gets elected as a tribune, right? And he shows up and he starts making waves in Roman society. He rolls in and he's like, you know what? It's disgusting the way that we take care of our veterans. We should be taking land from wealthy people and giving it to the veterans because they deserve it. And the only reason Rome is so great is because of these men, right? He financed a bill to help them out. And all the votes start flooding in for Tiberius Gracchus to go out there and help these Roman veterans. And guess what happens? The senators are going to roll up and be like, wait, 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 wait. That's our land you're talking about taking and giving to these veterans. That's our stuff you're talking about taking away and giving to them. We don't like this idea. So what's going to happen is, is as Tiberius Gracchus is getting elected to the tribunate for a second time in a row, he's walking all the votes back that are actually, because he's advocating for these veterans, he's walking all the votes back that have all the votes that are actually voting for him in this big jar. And then literally a bunch of senators jump out from behind a trash pit grab pieces of chairs, and they beat him to death with chairs, like off of a trash pit, pieces of wooden stools, right? So wait a minute. The senators have just murdered somebody. But are they charged for a crime? No, they're not, right? They're not charged whatsoever, right? They don't get charged for murder. They don't get charged for anything. And Tiberius Gracchus is now dead, right? Next guy shows up, and his name is Gaius Gracchus, right? The second of the Gracchi brothers, the much younger of the Gracchi brothers. He rolls up, and he wants to do all of his brother's reforms. He wants full citizenship for all Italians so all of them could vote. He used to speak to gigantic crowds inside of the forum and would be like, I am advocating for the veterans and for the people of this place and of this country and of, and of the peninsula so they can vote. And he also is going to be killed in cold blood as well by the Senate. And these reforms are going to trigger another civil war, right? But this is what we're going to do. We're going to stop right there. We're going to pick up on these two guys. We've got a lot of stuff to review tomorrow, and tomorrow is the best day ever. We'll talk about that soon. I'll see y'all soon. Bye.